Okay, I'll begin. We have, we are at five o'clock. Uh, good evening, my name is Ashok Kamat. I'm the Honorary Secretary of the IIT Alumni Center here in Bengaluru. And uh, this is our 12th webinar since we had the lockdown. Uh, it's a weekly webinar and uh, we've had a variety of speakers talk on a variety of topics uh, and uh, had an overwhelming response to this entire series. Today, uh, we are excited to have Professor Pushpak Bhattacharya, uh, Director of IIT Patna and uh, uh, a professor from IIT Bombay. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya is uh, best known probably as the leading expert on linguistics uh, when it comes to machine uh, natural language processing. And uh, besides, uh, uh, you know, just being a teacher, he has uh, uh, written over 300 papers in various areas of NLP. And uh, the topics are quite, you know, interesting uh, because it has to do with imparting sentiment and politeness on computers. So it's, it's, a, it's a very novel, you know, thought. Uh, for those of us who grew up with the PC in 1981, uh, politeness was not clearly there in uh, MS-DOS when we first started using it. Uh, uh, he, uh, Professor Bhattacharya is, of course, uh, uh, you know, a fellow of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, an IIT Kharagpur alumnus and got the Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIT Kharagpur. Uh, and uh, has many other awards to his name. Uh, moderating for him today, uh, we have two people. Uh, one is uh, his own student, Anup, uh, who currently works at Microsoft. And uh, it was a coincidence that when Anup's name came up, we realized that he was uh, a student of Professor Bhattacharya. And uh, that kind of adds to uh, because I'm sure he can uh, read professor's mind quite easily. Uh, and the other moderator, of course, from IIT ACB is Dr. Sushila Venkatraman. Uh, and uh, she will uh, be looking at the Q&A and the chat boxes quite regularly. A few housekeeping issues. Please do not put your questions in the chat box. Put them in the Q&A box because that's where we'll be looking for the questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, we will, if somebody does by mistake, put them in the chat box, we will uh, notify you. But uh, on the off chance that we fail to do that, you would have lost your chance to ask the question. So please put them in the Q&A box. Second, uh, uh, we've always had this question come up time and again, people asking us for certificates for attending a webinar like this. <laughs> Unfortunately, no certificates. Uh, so please do not ask us those questions also uh, during, your, during this entire webinar. Uh, we will have uh, a format where Professor Bhattacharya will speak for a while and break at, uh, at his convenience and we'll take questions and then he'll continue again. And somewhere around uh, 6.25, we will try to uh, summarize everything and get uh, to a closure by 6.30 p.m. With that, uh, Professor Bhattacharya, all yours. Thank you very much. Thanks to the IIT Bombay, uh, sorry, IIT Alumni Center at Bangalore for giving me this opportunity to present our work. So I'll first share my screen. Okay, so as uh, Ashok announced, the title of the presentation is Imparting Sentiment and Politeness on Computers. And the theme of the session today is on making computers human. A fairly dramatic title, I would say. Since the time computers came into the scene, we, our expectation from the machine has 
always increased, increased in two fronts. One is uh, speed of the machine, faster and faster computer. And the other is the, uh, the expectation to make them more and more intelligent. Now, uh, sentiment, politeness, they are human attributes. And as we try to bring the machine closer and closer to human beings, we would like to see these properties also. Now I'm deeply grateful to the two natural language processing groups I lead along with my colleagues, other faculty members, co-researchers at IIT Patna and IIT Bombay. I'll begin with a perspective on machine learning because these, the, the problem of sentiment, emotion analysis, making computers human, they are AI problems, artificial intelligence problems. And the predominant technique of artificial intelligence today is machine learning. Now, if we look at the paradigms of machine learning, we can put them in four groups. And uh, these are the groups which appeared on the stage in this sequence. So we have what is called table lookup, then rules, then statistical machine learning, and finally, today's paradigm, deep neural networks. I'll give an example. Suppose we want to teach the machine recognizing the alphabet A. The alphabet A is written in many different ways. The first A is the classical A. Then we have other different forms of A in different shapes and sizes. The last A is almost a suggestion of A, but we can make out the pattern from the context. Now, one method of learning, quote unquote learning, would be to store these patterns in a table. And when we see a new pattern, we would like to see the match with these table stored patterns and identify if the new pattern is an A or not. Now, since A can be written in many, many different ways, we have to store as many patterns as there are in the C. So that's not uh, very intelligent because in spite of all these variations, the pattern A has some invariant properties. And rule-based learning tries to latch onto those invariable properties. So a rule for learning the letter A would be this statement, letter A is formed from two inclined straight lines meeting at a point with the horizontal line cutting across. The essential features of, for a pattern to be an A are these, inclined straight lines meeting at a point and horizontal line cutting across. Now these properties are uh, not really sacrosanct. There can be exceptions. These lines need not be straight lines. They need not meet. And the third line need not be horizontal also. So all of these have exceptions. Therefore, if we are extremely strict about these three features of inclined straight lines meeting at a point and horizontal line cutting across, that may lead to what is called false negative. This is called error of omission. And if we relax the condition, then we may have the situation of false positivity. This is called error of commission. So we erroneously commit something. We brand a pattern as A. This is false positive when the pattern is not an A. And we miss out on patterns as being A when we denote a correct pattern as not A. So this is false positive and false negative, error of omission and commission. Now, it was uh, realized that the decisions 
on uh, various situations in life, including pattern recognition, need not be exact. We can work with approximate decisions, approximate uh, correctness. So from 100% to X% percent, where X is less than 100. So false positives and false negatives, to eliminate them completely is a very, very hard proposition and may not be worth it. Okay. The return on investment to eliminate error 100%, be it false positive or false negative, is not justified many times. So even humans cannot achieve that kind of performance. So decision making under uncertainty, under error bound, is the hallmark of intelligent behavior. Now, this distance from the exact decision, how do we measure that distance? We need a scoring mechanism. And fortunately for us, this very powerful mathematical framework of probability, many hundred years of accumulated knowledge in measure theory, statistics, probability comes to our help. So we go to the data and we learn the pattern from the data based on probabilistic scoring. And we have come to see through experiment after experiment, through application after application, that this combination of data and classifier is very powerful, so much so that large volume of data with powerful classifier can surpass human decision-making ability. So with lots of data, we can learn with high precision and high recall. That means small possibility of error of commission and small possibility of error of omission. However, this kind of learning, which is, which is now called classical machine learning, is based on human engineered features. You would recall two straight lines meeting at a point with a third horizontal line cutting across. These are human engineered features. Human beings look at the data and decide that these are the features based on which learning will take place. So this dependence on human judgment also is a limiting factor. And therefore, today's paradigm is called deep learning. This is also known as end-to-end decision making or pattern recognition, end-to-end -end machine learning, where we present only the data on the input side and make decisions or classification on the output side, leaving all the intermediate processing to many layers in between. So this is a typical deep neural network where a convolution and neural network is followed by a feed forward densely corrected network with a soft max at the output layer. All these are terminology which are very standard these days and uh, they only emphasize the fact that processing happens in multiple layers with input being uh, given and output received from many neurons at the output layer. So this is the deep learning system where there is ideally no feature engineering, but this is really an idealization as we'll see. So after this very, very brief uh, overview of machine learning or the essence of machine learning, we come to some remarks on natural language processing. This is illustrated through a practical application in the domain of call center analytics. A property and casualty insurance company has a call center. This call center is employed because the company cannot deal with customer complaints. The volume is huge. Even the call center cannot handle the volume. So automation is called for, which requires natural language understanding, automatic speech recognition, and very importantly, sentiment. So the spoken utterances are converted into text. Text is processed through natural language understanding. And finally, the sentiment is detected. Is the customer angry? Is the customer happy? Those sentiments are detected from the sentiment analysis 
techniques. One of the useful views of natural language processing is what is shown on this slide here. Natural language processing happens in layers, starting with morphology where the word is broken into parts. Jaunga, for example, is jana as the stem and unga, the suffix indicating future tense, first person singular number as the, as the features. Then the word goes through the part of speech tagging layer where nouns, verbs, adjectives are detected. Chunking where small phrases are formed, the blue sky. Parsing which produces the phrases in the sentence and dependencies. Semantics which does these are various kinds of disambiguation and semantic role identification. And finally, larger pieces of text are formed from small pieces of text through various resolutions like co-reference resolution, discourse processing, and so on. Natural language processing is also a three-dimensional problem where we deal with the languages of the world, which have their own properties. We solve a particular problem related to language, for example, parsing. And this is done through algorithms which are designed by uh, computer, computational uh, team. Uh, having proper expertise in machine learning, linguistics, language properties, and also a good sense of the problem. Now, we use language every day. We do not think about our capability of using language. This is a very spontaneous uh, capability of intelligent beings. Now, what is the exact challenge of natural language processing? A faculty that we use effortlessly, what exactly is the challenge of replicating this faculty on machines? So the main challenge or even the only challenge is ambiguity. There is ambiguity at various levels. So if I utter these words very rapidly, I got up late. It is not clear what I said. I got up late or I got a plate. So the translation of this sentence into Hindi or Marathi will depend on this, this ambiguity. There is this lexical ambiguity, which depends on the ambiguity of word meanings. So look at this interesting sentence, which recently came in newspapers. Maharashtra reports increased cases of COVID-19. One meaning would be Maharashtra has reported, has described, or brought to the notice of others, increased cases of COVID-19. But it is also possible to have another interpretation, which is not uh, likely, but that interpretation exists. Maharashtra reports, the reports from Maharashtra caused increase in cases of COVID-19. A very you know, unlikely interpretation, but it is not wrong if we go word by word. The reason for this ambiguity is reports can be nouns as well as verbs. Maharashtra reports, the first sense is verb sense. The, the second sense is noun sense where increase is the main verb. And in the other sense, reports is the main verb. Word groupings can lead to ambiguous situations. No dogs, please, depending on where you pause, where you put the punctuation, and also depending on uh, in various interpretations, you can get four meanings out of this sentence. Dogs are not allowed. No, dogs indeed are allowed. There is no dog that gives pleasure. No, dogs do give pleasure. Okay, all these four meanings can come from these three words depending on the pause and the meaning of please. Semantic role ambiguity. This is a very classic sentence. Flying planes can be dangerous. What is dangerous? Is act of flying dangerous or planes dangerous? In, in the first case, planes are objects of flying. In the second case, planes are subjects with predicate as being dangerous. There is what is called pragmatic ambiguity. There is an airline for which a, an irate customer remarks, thank you for sending my baggage to New York and myself to Chicago at the same time brilliant service. So the, on the surface, this looks like a 
a, a statement of praise, but actually the customer is unhappy. And if the chatbot replies, thank you, then the customer's irritation will increase. This course or code reference ambiguity arises from the noun pronoun binding, the cat went near the dog and it bit it. It is not clear who bit whom, the dog or the cat. So there is ambiguity at every layer. And this is the challenge that is posed by natural language processing when we teach machines how to use language. And this is not true of only English, all languages have ambiguity. Another sentence which uh, emphasizes the interlayer information transfer, the need for interlayer information transfer is this sentence. I saw the boy with a telescope. This is an ambiguous sentence. It's not clear who has the telescope. I saw the boy with the telescope, which he dropped accidentally. Now it is clear who has the telescope. But to process this second part of the sentence, the subordinate clause requires parsing to be done. And parsing to be done requires resolving the pronoun references, resolving this he to the correct noun. And there is a chicken and egg problem, a, a, a circularity in the problem, which can be broken only by uh, only through the back and forth information transfer between different layers of natural language processing. So this is where deep learning comes into play. A neural network with multiple layers is a natural matching technique for natural language processing, which is also done in multiple layers. Now we have been doing natural language processing in IIT Bombay and recently at IIT Bombay, the IIT Patna. The IIT Bombay lab is in existence since 2000. It is a lab for processing Indian languages and another lab called AI Natural Language Processing Machine Learning Lab in IIT Patna. This is in existence since 2015. We uh, tackle many different areas of natural language processing, starting with machine translation, and going up to cognitive natural language processing through sentiment analysis, information extraction, lexical semantics, and so on. We believe both linguistics and computation are important and use this statement in our lab, linguistics is the eye and computation is the body. So linguistics gives the insight and computation realizes that insight to build practical, prop, practical applications. Now we come to uh, the topic of today, namely uh, sentiment analysis. But here, since 20 minutes are over, maybe I'll take a break and uh, see if there are questions which the audience might want to ask. Any questions, comments? I think there are no questions in the Q&A box yet. Okay. But you may so, want to and, you know. So, Anup, if you have anything to say at this point. Oh, suddenly we have a couple. Oh, you have, okay. Anup? Yeah, hello, yeah, just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, one uh, one question. Uh, so uh, so question from Vasu. Like, uh, uh, is it it's interesting? Like, is it true that the level of ambiguity varies with different languages? Um, no, um, all languages have ambiguity, but uh, the variation can come in different layers. So languages, for example, differ in morphology. There are morphologically strong languages like Hungarian, Turkish, Dravidian languages, where a huge amount of information is placed on the words. My favorite example is Hindi and English comparison. Now, if I look at the two words, will go, auxiliary verb and main verb, it is not clear if the number is plural or singular. I will go, we will go. So number is uh, left ambiguous. 
person is also ambiguous he will go i will go but take the hindi uh, correspond, corresponding string jaunga or jayega so when i see jaunga there is no ambiguity it is i first person singular number and future tense so because of will the tense is disambiguated but there is no other clue with respect to person and number but for hindi the person and number is indicated on the word itself but does it mean that hindi is has less ambiguity compared to english no as we move up the layer we go to more and more difficult problems of semantics question answering sentiment analysis we see uh, ambiguity appearing whatever with the language and measuring ambiguity uh, is still a distant proposition there are entropy measures but they really do not indicate uh, ambiguity as precisely as we want to be done so so one related question that seems to be popular with a lot of people is is uh, it is said that sanskrit is unambiguous is it true um sanskrit encodes lot of information on the word and that's why there is this uh, this feeling that sanskrit is unambiguous and this is a pretty old notion but that's not true really again my favorite example here is bridhasya mitrasya graham three words bridhasya mitrasya graham now uh, one translation of this is the old friend's house okay the old friend's house here bridha is bridha meaning old is adjective for mitra which is friend the other meaning is the old man's the old man's friend's house so here bridha is a noun so here bridha means an old man so the the sentence can mean old man's friend's house or old friend's house so this is this ambiguity is arising because the word bridha can be both adjective and noun so this part of speech ambiguity is in existence for sanskrit also and therefore higher levels of natural language processing have ambiguity problem even for sanskrit if we can take one more and then uh, yeah. go ahead uh, so uh, i this one question something similar that i had in mind so when you initially talked about uh, the how machine learning has evolved learning has mm -hmm. evolved uh, you sort of uh, alluded to these different uh, layers uh, different approaches where more and more data is being used essentially uh, lesser expertise as i see it is required uh, mm -hmm. uh, in some areas uh, but maybe more expertise on the algorithmic front less on, less on domain front so this sort of introduces a challenge of uh, uh, how do you start off with many many say problems or languages where there is little data so mm -hmm. we combine approaches in certain ways right so uh, so you see uh, what uh, data scientists and machine learning researchers do is that uh, they try to extract as much as they can from data now when uh, data is in short supply they lean on their insight into the problem so if i take a problem of language processing to be solved by machine learning and if i uh, see sparsity of data then i uh, appeal to insight into language and who gives me insight into language the branch of knowledge that gives me insight into language is linguistics so linguistics studies phonology phonetics morphology semantics syntax these are traditional divisions of linguistics so the insights from these areas namely the syntactic structure the morphological behavior of words they are taken and they are encoded on the data the data is embellished with this kind of linguistic properties 
An example is factor-based machine, statistical machine translation. So people try to make up for data with linguistic insight, a situation which is a reversal of what used to happen before. People used to rely on, rely completely on a problem insight and going forward would understand that the problem insight is limited by our own understanding. So therefore we would like to augment the problem solving situation with data. So data and problem specific insight are synergistic forces to solve a problem. Okay. Sure. Uh, thanks, sir. So maybe we can continue and then continue. Yes. So uh, the topic for today, sentiment analysis, the first part of the topic. Uh, sentiment is uh, formally defined by a five tuple where the third entity, SO, is the most important a component of the tuple, which is sentiment on an object O for a feature F by an opinion holder H at a time T. So this is a five tuple definition of sentiment analysis. And we'll see with an example that this five tuple definition is very important. Otherwise there can be confusion going forward. So this is a long sentence. I love the songs in the movie though only the cast was liked by my brother, who said the director was of the opinion that the storyline, which is from a novel by Shakespeare, will be lapped up by the public. So this sentence is complex because there are many nouns, many verbs, and there is complex interaction of who likes what and when. So this can be organized in the form of what is called triples by dependency parsing. And we have these combinations. I love song, brother like cast, director like storyline, public lap up, storyline. Though Shakespeare appears in the text, Shakespeare is not a participant in the sentiment analysis processing. Now it is important to create these tuples carefully and accurately. Otherwise, the sentiment decision can be wrong. So there is a relationship between me and song. Brother and cast. I love the song. I, I there is a, nothing is said about my opinion about the cast or my brother's opinion about the storyline. Okay, so it is important to pair these uh, nouns properly along with their sentiment value. So this is what is ensured in the five tuple definition that we just now saw. Sentiment analysis is a multi-dimensional problem involving languages, involving the granularity of sentiment involving the kind of machine learning paradigm we use, the resources, the emotion dictionary, for example, which is used, and how is the sentiment expressed? So for example, the ordinal value of one, two, three, four, five, going one being very negative, five being very positive, and so on. Then features which are used for machine learning are syntactic dependencies, discourse features, that is words, phrases, and so on. So it is a complex problem involving attention to be given to multiple dimensions. And this point about sentiment being sensitive to the language that is used is an important one. Now, uh, these days, multimodality is becoming increasingly important in sentiment analysis. The problem of sentiment analysis, let us remember, is to see if a computer can detect the sentiment of an utterance or a piece of text. Also, can it produce sentiment? For example, a chatbot, can it uh, show emotion, em empathy, et cetera, when it is interacting with a customer? Now, multimodality is important because facial expressions, tonality, they play an important role in detecting sentiment. So this becomes all the more important when we deal with a very difficult problem called sarcasm. So if you look at the text only, ooh, wow, well done. This looks like a praise. But look at the body language of the speaker. This is very negative. So a positive uh, sentiment text with a negative sentiment body language shows that there is something special about the situation. That speciality is the very difficult problem of sarcasm. 
we have done a lot of research into computational sarcasm detection and i'll talk about it during the course of the presentation emotion analysis is a slightly more difficult problem because in sentiment analysis we only concentrate on neutrality positivity and negativity in emotion analysis we have to deal with multiple emotions which is a which makes it a multi class machine learning problem for example you have to deal with finer levels like anger disgust happiness and so on now there has been lot of work into emotion the the psychology of emotion and uh, two basic emotions have been identified happiness and sadness then the psychologist ekman's uh, dis, uh, distribution of emotions is very classical there are six emotions anger disgust fear sadness happiness and surprise Plutchik and the psychologist introduced two more emotions: anticipation and trust. And India also contributed to this research on uh, psychology of emotions through what is called Navarasa, which a dancer must master. A Bharatanatyam dancer, Odissi dancer, for example, should be able to depict or express these nine emotions, which are called Navarasa. now plutchik's wheel of emotion which came from the psychologist plutchik in 1982 uh, is very uh, important and fundamental to computational emotion detection there are eight basic emotions anticipation joy trust fear surprise sadness disgust and anger so this wheel structure is very interesting because as we go from center to the periphery the intensity of emotion decreases so terror is very intense fear is less intense apprehension is the least intense and similarly the the area between two petals is the combination emotion region for example joy and trust together produce love so this was a very nice contribution from plutchik where emotions have been categorized and even combination emotions have been identified with their constituents we have been working on sentiment analysis emotion analysis since 2000 and uh, this matrix so shows the techniques we have used over the years from rule based to classical machine learning to deep learning to hybrid based and many different kinds of sentiment analysis problems we have dealt with like basic sentiment sentiment thwarting sarcasm emoji identification cross and multilingual sentiment analysis and sentiment analysis in dialogues so sentiment analysis in dialogues is one of our most recent efforts we have been working on this since 2018 with the application of classical machine learning and deep learning and hybrid based methods moving forward i take up a specific piece of recent work uh, this is done with uh, our phd student tulika saha at iit patna another uh, student aditya patra at iit patna and with uh, Uh, Dr. Sriparna Shah, who is my uh, collaborator and faculty member at IIT Patna. So this is towards the emotion-aided multimodal dialogue act classification. This uh, proceeds from the observation that dialogue act classification in has the objective of identifying the intent. So a dialogue is taking place between two speakers or multi speaker multiple speakers. and each turn is primarily a question a statement or a request for action with variations on these three basic uh, aspects question or statement or request for action so there has been lot of work in dialogue act classification that means the basic question is to identify is this turn of dialogue a question or a statement or a request for action so a chatbot for example needs to understand is the input from the user a question or a statement or action and similarly has to understand the next the response from it should it be a statement or a request for action or a question so there has been lot of work from uh, linguists as well as computer computer scientists and psychologists and uh, we and uh, the researchers have understood that non verbal features like change of tone facial expression they provide beneficial cues to identify the dialogue act so for example the raised a eyebrows can show that this turn of the dialogue is a question 
So uh, to, to exemplify what I'm saying is, is uh, this statement, ha ji ha. And in fact, uh, emotion also is expressed in these dialogue acts. For example, ha ji ha could be a statement denoting agreement, or it can be a disagreement in a sarcastic way, ha ji ha, where the tone shows that the, uh, the, the speaker is not satisfied with the situation. And this ha ji ha is actually a negative statement, which is a disagreement. So we understood that identifying the turn of the dialogue as question, statement, or action also depends on the emotion and the tonality and facial features. So this is multimodal emotion-assisted dialogue act classification. So our contribution was we created a data set which other researchers can use. We have trained a model with this data set. This model can be used for new dialogue situations. And we have also established that capturing multimodality, that is the visual clues and the speech audio clues is helpful for classifying the dialogues. And detecting emotion alongside helps uh, this task of dialogue, dialogue act classification. The ta these tasks help each other. So uh, dialogue act classification can be looked upon as a sequence leveling task as the Next slide shows there are two, two persons interacting with each other. They are in a dialogue. There are two persons, A and B. So A first says, so do you go to the college right now? So if B is a computer, uh, then the B should identify that this is a yes no question. And then A starts to say something more, are you, then abandons this, and then says, yes, it is my last year. And, and then abandons, abandons this because B says yes, it is my last year. So this way the dialogue proceeds and each of these turns have a label, whether it's a question or abandon, declarative question, appreciation, uh, back channel and so on. So this becomes what is called a sequence leveling problem. There are a sequence of turns which we have to level. And if we can identify the emotion, for example, laughter, we see these laughter expressions, then this task becomes a little easier. So it is customary to report in this kind of uh, work, what was the data? How did the data come along? What is the source of the data? What is the quality of the data, size of the data, which is fed into the machine learning uh, technique? So there are many different kinds of data. I'm not going to read them, but we have taken IEMO CAP and MELD data set, these two data sets. And, uh, these have been processed further for creating the data set for our problem. So uh, 12 frequently occurring attacks have been used, beating, apology, command, question, answer, agreement, and so on. And we have uh, about 20,000 uh, statements in a dialogue sequence, which have been annotated this way along with emotion. So this becomes a very valuable res resource for researchers working on uh, dialogue act and emotion analysis also. So here is a graphical, uh, a, a graphics which is describing some of the properties of this data set. For example, in these 20,000 uh, statements in dialogue acts, there are a large number of statements which are not opinions. Then there are uh, questions, then there are answers. Also opinions are quite high in proportion. And if we look at the emotion distribution, then neutral statements are maximum in number, followed by happy, followed by frustrated, anger, sadness, and so on. So this is the property of the data, showing distribution of emotion and showing the distribution of kinds of dialogue terms. Now, uh, the case for multimodality is apparent from these dialogues. For example, if we look at two, that is very amusing indeed. So if we look at the text alone, that, then it looks like, a, looks like an appreciation, a statement which is happy. But actually, uh, if we look at the facial expression and the audio, audio is sarcastic tone and video shows slight anger. So this, these three uh, clues, these three signals should be processed together to understand this dialogue and also to make an appropriate response to this dialogue. 
Now, the technique that we used is a machine learning, deep learning based technique, which makes use of textual uh, features. The text is converted to vectors by making use of what is called embeddings. These are deep learning uh, constituents. We capture the audio features, for example, MFCC features, voiced segments, speech, and their statistics. Also, male frequency coefficients, okay, which are which come from um, ASR, automatic speech recognition. And uh, these features are put together to create what is called a vector, audio vector. Similarly, the visual features are put together, uh, obtained through image net, rest net. These are techniques in deep learning system. Finally, we get a representation, which is shown in this diagram. This is a, a complex picture depicting a deep neural network where in the input layer, we can see the video input, the text input, and the audio input all converted into vectors. They pass through what is called a triplet attention layer. That means all these different features of video, text, and audio are combined together. And finally, in the outermost layer, we get the dialogue act and the emotion. So this is, the, uh, this is, this is a very typical, a very classical, deep learning network with multiple layers and multiple compartments doing a particular task. So the first compartment uh, simply processes the input. The second compartment sort of combines the text, audio, and video features. And the final compartment gives the decision on the dialogue act. Is it a question or a statement or request for action or some kind of variation on that? And also the emotion, anger, joy, sadness, and so on. Now, uh, it is also customary to report the performance of the system by means of numbers. And these numbers are in the form of what is called accuracy, F1 score, etc. People in the field use these metrics. So these are metrics for performance. Now, uh, the most uh, important and most interesting co component in this table is this emoti dia, which is a dyadic situation. That means it is a two-part dialogue. And we find that the best accuracy is obtained when we do dialogue act classification and emotion recognition together. This DA plus ER means dialogue act classification and emotion recognition are happening together. So we get best accuracy for, for when we use both text and video. So multimodality is important. Multitasking is important. So dialogue act and emotion both together, text and video as input, both together. Okay, so this establishes the fact that a multitask, multimodality approach to dialogue act classification is useful. So the case study that uh, we did was on friends data set. And here you can see uh, there are five uh, dialogue terms and their true levels are disagreement, agreement, opinion, and apology. Our system produces uh, disagreement, agreement, statement, and apology, whereas uh, a single task system with text and video produces statement, opinion, question, and another statement. This is very different from the true level. Our leveling is closer to the tr true level. So we report numbers, we report qualitative case study to establish the fact that uh, our uh, system is better than the state of the art and uh, show that emotion and multimodality in dialogue act classification is useful. The data set is contributed to the researchers and they can use this for dialogue act classification research. The whole system is attention based, which combines text, vision, audio, and video features. And uh, both multitasking and, and multitasking, uh, both the multimodality and multitasking are useful for doing this task. I will um, uh, uh, quickly finish the next part of the discussion and then hand over to again Anoop and question answering. This part is not very big. I must mention that sarcasm detection has been one of our important contributions from the lab. Sarcasm is a very difficult problem where uh, the statement is deceptive. deceptive. It looks like a positive sentiment, appreciation, joy, etc. but the underlying sentiment is exactly opposite. And we found when we used 
uh, standard machine learning techniques on uh, benchmark data that the accuracy falls by about half when the input is sarcastic. So on non-sarcastic text, the accuracy is 50%, 80% uh, by different techniques. And this accuracy becomes almost half when the uh, input is sarcastic. So that showed that we need to deal with sarcasm in a special way. Sarcastic statements in a special way. Now, when people uh, produce sarcasm, when they uh, resort to sarcastic uh, statements, they also uh, leave clues. For example, laughter expressions are quite liberally used. Heavy punctuation use is used. Protein shake for dinner. Two exclamations, three, three exclamations. Then emoticons are used, interjections are used, capital letters are used. So these uh, clues are important for detecting a sarcastic situation. So users make use of a, make use of a, uh, the speakers may, or writers make use of a very complex instrument, the instrument of sarcasm, but also leave behind quite a few clues which are called pragmatic clues. Now, uh, we have, our contribution is the following. We understood that sarcasm arises from what is called incongruity. So I love being ignored is a sarcastic statement. 3 a.m. at work, yeah, yeah, is again a sarcastic statement. They are sarcastic because they um, are, they have incongruity. Love is a positive sentiment word. Ignore is negative sentiment. Yeah, yeah is positive sentiment. Somebody working at 3 a.m. is a negative situation. So the presence of both positivity and negativity is an incongruous situation, and that is exploited for algorithm design. So this is the work of my PhD student, Dr. Aditya Joshi, and his investigations into sarcasm was very deep and broad. Now, incongruity can be explicit. I love being ignored, where positive and negative sentiment-bearing words appear, uh, appear overtly on the surface of the sentence. And implicit incongruity is the situation where uh, negative praise or the positive praise is implicit. I love this paper so much that I made a doggy bag out of this. This paper refers to a research paper. The purpose of a research paper is to obtain knowledge, not really to make a doggy bag. So this is implicit incongruity. Now, we latched on to incongruity and we gave uh, different techniques for uh, sarcasm detection. And through the exploitation of incongruity, we, sh we could devise systems, we could engineer systems whose accuracy were better than anything existing as state of the art. Now here we made use of na uh, standard natural language processing features like unigrams, which are words, then pragmatic features, which are left behind by users, the writers or the speakers. Um, in the text, capitalization, emoticon, punctuation marks, etc. And incongruity both in implicit and explicit form are detected by making use of various kinds of dictionaries and language resources. So uh, we, uh, just to emphasize this point, that we exploit incongruity and, and uh, add them to standard sentiment detection, natural language processing detection, detection uh, features namely words and punctuation marks and so on. So we have used tweet data, discussion data, and here the numbers which are in capital show that our system in different forms of text perform much better than state of the art. So the main point made here is that uh, we give an algorithm, uh, algorithmic realization of the linguistic concept of inc incongruity to detect sarcasm. And then came what is called word embedding, the deep learning era, where we made use of word embeddings in a pretty clever way to detect incongruity. So if you take this sentence, which appears in the corpus, a man needs a woman like a fish needs bicycle. This is a sarcastic statement because the similarity value between man and woman is much, much more than similarity value between fish and bicycle. Fish is uh, hardly like bicycle but man and woman are very similar to each other, being species of human beings. Now they are linked, these two parts of the sentence are linked by a preposition called like, whose property is to link to very similar pieces of text. Here that similarity is broken because fish is not similar to bicycle while man is similar to woman. 
So this similarity is computed by means of cosine similarity of word embeddings, slightly technical here. And this uh, has been exploited to capture incongruity as well as sarcasm. So we again made use of different features uh, of incongruity text and, uh, and then made use of this cosine similarity based on embeddings. We use them on different data sets, which are standard benchmark data. And we found again that with uh, different kinds of embeddings, we could improve upon the reported work wherever we made use of this kind of similarity values of word embeddings. For example, for compared to L, which is a particular piece of work due to depression, we uh, had our accuracy value close to 80, whereas their, accuracy, their F score value was close to 76. So this was the, uh, uh, this was the uh, observation for many different reported work with many different kinds of word embeddings. We also tackled a very difficult kind of sarcasm, which is called numerical sarcasm. Sarcasm itself is difficult, but numerical sarcasm is still more difficult because the sarcasm arises from numbers. 3 a.m. at work, yeah, yeah. 3 a.m. at work is not very good. 9 a.m. at work, yeah, yeah. This is normal, but 3 a.m. is not normal. So this sarcasm is due to a number, and that is a very difficult proposition. So here also we made use of rule-based approach, machine learning-based approach, and deep learning-based approach. Neural network based approach gave us an accuracy of about 93%, which was better than anything reported at that time. So this was uh, the part on sarcasm uh, and the sub part on numerical sarcasm. And uh, the, this short description was to say that we uh, found a solution to this difficult problem of computational sarcasm detection. So at this point of time, I'll again take a break for question answering and I'll move to politeness after that. But before that, anything on sarcasm and sentiment um, and emotion and dialogue act classification. Any questions on that? Okay. Hello, sir. Yeah, sitting here, a few questions. And just yes. pick up a few, a uh, lot of questions. I'll pick a few in the interest of time. So, uh, one interesting question. So, uh, so your work shows that uh, with dialogue act classification, that getting multiple uh, modalities. Uh, uh, helps to improve the uh, systems, uh, uh, mm -hmm. probably because of ambiguity resolution. Uh, so one question to pour over from Deepak is whether uh, ambiguities can also be introduced by different modalities. Uh, so for instance, mm -hmm. uh, body languages can have different interpretations in different cultures. Uh, mm -hmm. Or if you're using emojis, then that they can have different meanings in different contexts. So, Right. How do we factor that? Very in? good question. But uh, you know, there is one observation that uh, in Bengali we say "bishe bishokhoy." That means poison can cure poison. So uh, it is a frequent observation in, especially in language processing, uh, that uh, that two ambiguous entities can disambiguate each other. So a very uh, classic example of that is relational semantics. The word net is created based on that principle. So uh, uh, words can be ambiguous, but when we put synonymous words together, many times the unique meaning emerges. So the word ghar in Hindi, for example, is ambiguous. Ghar has many, many, many different meanings. But if we uh, create a set, which is called a sin set with ghar and parivar together, then the meaning that emerges is family. So parivar can be ambiguous, ghar can be ambiguous, but their combination is not ambiguous. Now, it is true that the body language or the body signals are ambiguous, that can be. And uh, the text also is ambiguous, but when we put them together, we hope that uh, the ambiguity gets either attenuated or completely eliminated. But this is a good question. We need to uh, study this point, whether uh, additional ambiguity can arise from multimodality. Okay. So uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, Prutchik's uh, analysis of basic emotions and the way they can be combined into uh, 
other emotions so uh, a couple of uh, questions so one uh, one like uh, from my uh, uh, work on like when we look at uh, translation etc we always uh, see if the neural network can give you uh, representations of language similarity differences etc so is there work that kind of shows uh, whether neural network representations can uh, find out uh, or validate kluchik's analysis to say that these basic emotions are are the basic emotions then these are combinations of uh, emotions um yes yeah, so uh, we actually have started investigating a specific problem uh, that problem is emotion analysis computational emotion analysis using machine learning suffers from data sparsity it is not easy to create emotion annotated data and even when we uh, get the annotation done the inter annotator agreement that means agreement between the annotators uh, many times is low it is quite easy to confuse joy, joy with surprise disgust with anger disgust with anger is a very very um, common situation of confusion so data sparsity is uh, is definitely hurting this kind of analysis so uh, your question related to uh, data sparsity right uh, data sparsity and also like can we uh, uh, validate the kind of analysis that kluchik has done oh, okay. through what we yeah, see yeah. from the data right so one one piece of work that we started with a few students is that uh love is said to be a combination emotion so it is joy and trust so that's what uh, platchik documents this uh, emotion as similarly there are other combination emotions now what we embarked on is we take uh, embeddings of these words love joy and surprise and their synonyms and then we try to see if this uh, embedding of love or associated and synonymous words can be obtained by some kind of combination linear or you know polynomial combination of uh, of joy and trust or their synonyms so we have started investigating this question and uh, if this really holds then it will reduce the data requirement quite a lot that means you will not have to annotate for example the emotion of love on the data because it can be generated from the constituent emotions of joy and trust so this uh, needs investigation and this this needs validity sure i think maybe we can continue and then take more questions yeah. towards sure. the sure. end so in the third part of the presentation i take up a very important problem which is important for all organizations which employ uh, chatbots for customer interaction so this is uh, the work uh, primarily of our phd student mozama firdos at iit patna uh, her btech associate hitesh and uh, Uh, Dr. Asif Iqbal, who is my collaborator and co-researcher at IIT Patna. Now, uh, Cartier's behavior is very important for business for industry. If we complain about a bad meal in a restaurant, we usually get an apology from the manager, and we might get a free dinner also. So, a, and a Cartier's expression is a polite remark or a respectful act. now our problem statement is the following uh, our domain is customer care on twitter the input to our module is the output of a chatbot it is a generic chatbot reply and the output from our module is a polite uh, form of that reply the information content is same which is technically called um, adequacy compliance but the output is more polite than the output of the chatbot so that is the task we are addressing so we want the output to be emotionally aware 
It should use Cartier's phrases and emoticons to display appreciation, empathy, apology, and assurance. So let me give an example. This is an example of generic conversation. User says, you all just came to my house like last week and I'm having problems with my internet again, SMH. System response, what is happening with your internet? User, I think there is an outage. System response, there may be maintenance work in your area. Please direct message your info. So this is all right. As far as dialogue is concerned, it is all right. It is making sense and the system's responses are adequate. However, a Cartier's conversation, which could be expected is this system response. Instead of just saying what is happening with your internet, system response, oh no, that's not good. I can help. What is happening with your internet? User, I think there is an outage. Then system says there may be maintenance work in your area. Please DM your info. This is the information content. Thanks for using our services. That is the finishing line. And this shows more empathy on the part of the chatbot or the system. And it gives little more comfort uh, for the user in using the system. And this is a very practical problem, very live problem also. Organizers are, organizers are indeed interested in chatbots that display empathy and emotion. So now the challenge here is that uh, we want to use machine learning because the need for machine learning here is that it is almost impossible. It would be a very, very complex task to produce a rule-based system here. Because a human being will have to sit down and give rules for producing polite expression. And that will require understanding, first of all, what is politeness? And to our surprise, we found there is a lot of work on politeness, the linguistics of politeness, psychology, philosophy of politeness, cognitive aspects of politeness, and so on. But turning all this knowledge, which is accumulated over many, many years into an algorithm or a data structure or a set of precise rules, which a machine can process is a very, is a humongous task. So we resort to machine learning, hoping that the deep neural network or a classical machine learning system will absorb the patterns in the data and capture the clues from the data and produce uh, politeness expressions, polite expressions, or will detect the absence or presence of politeness. However, uh, data itself is also a challenge because polite, uh, politeness mark data, annotated data is in short supply. In fact, we have contributed data in this area. The annotation of the data is fraught with a lot of subjectivity and capturing the correct emotion, which is relate, a related point, is not easy annotators differ in their judgment about what is the politeness level or politeness presence. So it is a novel piece of research and we are, I believe, pioneers in this kind of investigation. The data set is conversational data set with politeness embedded. The politeness part is our contribution. We have created a strong benchmark model which other researchers can use. And since we produce the politeness expression as output, this is the, uh, can be looked upon as a standalone natural language generation system also. It produces uh, natural language sentences where the sentences are polite. Now, again, as is customary, we report on the source of data, size of the data. Uh, that this is Twitter data from what is called Kegel competition. Uh, it is a tweet repository, three annotators with Kappa score 85%. That, that is an indication of the level of their agreement. They annotated the data. Purely Cartier's expressions were removed because we want to teach Cartier to a machine. Purely informative sentences were retained and sentences which ha had politeness, they were transformed into purely informative sentences. So we established a correspondence between informative sentences and the corresponding polite sentences to learn these uh, correspondence. So the input would be a neutral statement and output will be a polite corresponding expression. So again, following the convention, we report the quantity of the data, total number of conversations are about two lakhs. Total utterances are about 4.5 lakhs. 
training conversations are 1.4 lakhs. This is the data which is used to train a machine. The machine parameters are further tuned using about 20,000 expressions. And the unseen data uh, amounts to about 40,000 expressions. So it is customary uh, and conventional to report the data that is used for machine learning. Now, the methodology is copying the informative part and inserting the politeness part. This is the methodology. So if we have an output from the chatbot, how can we help? Uh, a Cartier's expression will be help has arrived. We are sorry to see that you are having trouble. How can we help? And this is a kind of apologetic expression. So the blue part is the politeness uh, text and black part is the informative part, which is uh, passed forward as such. So the first suggestion for technique would be a sequence to sequence transformer, what is called a sequence to sequence transformer. This is a hierarchical encoder. Hierarchical because each part of the encoder is processing one sentence and this combination is processing a full part of the dialogue. And this transforms an input informative sentence to a Cartier's response. But the, the, the research team of students found out that these responses lack in diversity. The chatbot may always respond as, thank you, it is a pleasure. Whereas the human user desires little more variety on the output. So that could be uh, arranged for by making use of a little more sophisticated structure. The sequence to sequence uh, transformer always, of course exists as the uh, fundamental module, but on it, there is augmented to it, it, there is a reinforcement learning based module which ensures diversity. And as is the uh, convention again in machine learning situations, uh, the loss function which measures the departure from the target or expected behavior is carefully designed. Uh, uh, the, the students came up with an with a with a pretty uh, novel idea, namely combining uh, the maximum likelihood estimate technique and reinforcement lear learning to create a two-part loss function. So maximum likelihood estimate is based on what is called language modeling. We predict the next piece of text from previously appearing phrases and words. Okay? And it is, it is maximizing the probability of the next piece of text. So this is mainly dealing with the uh, authenticity of information transfer. The information, main information content should be faithfully transferred. Help has arrived. The factors help has arrived is an info piece of information. This should be faithfully reproduced. But, there is also uh, a component of the loss function, which is based on reinforcement learning. It in introduces diversity in the response. And in this case, since it is a natural language generation system, because a, an input informative content is transformed into a polite expression, this is like a machine translation situation. So here uh, in machine translation situation, the departure from the target behavior or consistency with the target behavior is measured by what is called the blue score. So blue score is like a feedback. It is distance from the target behavior, which is used as reward or punishment in a reinforcement learning situation. So this maximum likelihood estimate and reinforcement learning based expression, they are combined together with different weightages, okay? So LMLE is based on maximum likelihood estimate and RL is based on reinforcement learning. These two are combined together to produce a loss function which produces faithful content along with politeness. So we again uh, did um, exhaustive evaluation on benchmark data. 
starting from sequence to sequence transformer, which is our baseline model. Then we snapped on pointer generator model, emotion embedding model, and finally the proposed model, which is a combination of reinforcement learning and maximum likelihood estimate on a hierarchical encoder with reinforcement learning mod module. The matrix are matrix for natural language generation, namely blue score, rouge score from summarization literature, perplexity score, then um, content preservation, which is like adequacy and emotion accuracy. So th there are many uh, technical words, but all it means is that we are trying to see how faithful the output of the output of our, of our system was to the initial input. Initial input, let us remember, output of a chatbot. So is it faithful in terms of information transfer? And EA, which is the emotional accuracy, that shows the correctness of the politeness part of the output. So looking at the numbers, we find that emotional accuracy, our model is achieving an accuracy of 86% compared to the baseline model, which are close to 82. So we are able to improve on the state of the art through, the, through our model. Similarly, blue score is a good measure of faithful transfer of information. So here again, our score is much, much better than basic vanilla model, which is sequence to sequence transformer that is 56 to 69. Similarly, perplexity decreased from uh, 58 to 42. But uh, our model could not surpass this score. The perplexity value for our model is 43, but much, much better than a vanilla baseline model. This was automatic evaluation, mechanical evaluation. Human uh, beings also evaluated. Human evaluation also was done where uh, the Carsey appropriateness is the most interesting parameter. So, uh, one is very, very appropriate. Zero is somewhat appropriate. Minus one is completely inappropriate. So zero is non cartius One is an output with appropriate level of cartiousness, And minus one is non cartius at all. So we can see that our proposed model scores uh, very well on uh, Cartesian Cart appropriateness because about 44% of the outputs are in one category, 41% is zero category. That means it is transferring information and also achieving uh, cartiousness in the output expression. So here, here are a few examples of cartiass response and some of them are very interesting. The generic output from a chatbot is uh, DMS, direct message as more info and We'll take a look into it for you. The first module, uh, first model, which is a sequence to sequence transformer, simply produced, we'll look into it. So it almost uh, uh, output only the essence of the information present in the input. The second model is little more polite. I am sorry to hear this. Please DM us more info and we'll take a look into it for you. The third model, which had emotional embedding, we are here to help. Please direct message us more info and we'll take a look into it for you. And our model, which combines reinforced learning and maximum likelihood estimate said, we are here to help. Please DM us more info and we'll take a look into it for you at the earliest. So at the earliest was an insertion proactively by our system. So it almost uh, you know, behaved uh, more human, exceeded the expectation by being uh, more polite than other models. So at the earliest is a very reassuring phrase. So it is not only polite, it is also giving reassurance. This was the output from our system. And as is the case for most deep learning situations, we cannot explain how it uh, came about. How did this phrase come in the output? But we were pleasantly surprised. So I'd like, now like to uh, summarize the presentation. Uh, we uh, built a background by giving a machine learning perspective, namely four kinds of machine learning, starting from table lookup, going up to deep learning, where no human intervention is required at the end. 
but that is only an idealization. Then uh, the natural language perspective was built, different layers of NLP, dimensions of NLP, and the main problem was identified as ambiguity. At every layer of natural language processing, there is ambiguity. Machine learning and natural language processing have come closer to each other because we uh, cannot really produce exact decision. We have to live with approximate decision, but that is often very good and good enough. And that is where the goodness is measured by probabilistic scores. So machine learning uses probability and classifier for solving natural language processing tasks. So for us, the main problem is sentiment and emotion analysis. Perspective on sentiment and emotion through work on psychology, Bakchik's emotion will, Ekman's emotion, our Navarasa from Indian tradition. Our investigation into dialogue act classification showed that capturing multimodality makes uh, the classification of dialogue more accurate. And on top of that, if we make the task multitasking, that is, if we detect emotion and dialogue act together, then we achieve accuracy on both fronts. So this is an important contribution of the work, namely capture tonality, capture body language, and capture the text to detect emotion as well as dialogue act. The very challenging problem of sarcasm for that we uh, gave a solution, we uh, exploited incongruity and algorithmized the notion of incongruity. Computational politeness is one of the frontiers we have investigated into and we have i think advanced this frontier so all these problems namely dialogue act classification sarcasm politeness are really in the frontier of natural language processing and machine learning our conclusions are from this work we draw some insights that um, making computers human is really becoming a reality that time is really not far where chatbots will have a lot of empathy, will display a lot of emotion. Understanding and producing sentiment and emotion is a highly interesting and practical problem. As I mentioned many times, uh, I interact with many organizations and I consult with many organizations. So the, there is a huge need, immediate need for um, emotional computational systems, AI systems which are emotional especially in the chatbot domain. Deep learning with the data, with huge amount of data is the key methodology for solving these very challenging problems. But uh, where, where do you find so much data? Therefore, you have to make insight, make use of insight from the problem, make use of insight from linguistics, phonology, psychology, cognitive science, and so on. The other problem is explainability. If the chatbot is producing a kind of response, which may be is not appropriate, then we have to investigate it, investigate from the machine learning system what exactly has gone wrong. Now, this becomes an extremely challenging problem for deep learning systems because they have many, many layers of processing, many parameters, huge number of neurons. So it really becomes an inscrutable proposition, inscrutable system. Now, research directions are deep learning with less data, cross domain and cross lingual assistance is becoming important. A sentiment analysis system built for English, can it be used for Hindi, Marathi, or Hungarian, for example? So, this is cross lingual sentiment and emotion analysis. And an important mathematical question is the right loss function for right problems. You, we saw in the third problem that combining reinforcement learning with maximum likelihood was good for producing polite outputs with diversity. Everything I've said is linked uh, as research papers from my homepage and from our labs, both labs at IIT Patna and IIT Bombay, we have contributed many tools, resources, and data sets, which researchers can use. I will end my presentation with a final message. We have found again and again that natural language processing is a task in trade-off. We cannot have too much of information because that lead, leads to misleading signals and we can have uh, topic drift we can have what is called drift we drift away from the right path and if we have too little data then there is data uh, data sparsity problem 
one of the questions was on ambiguity insertion. This is true. In a text, for example, if we have too many, too long a context, then the words in the context can introduce their own ambiguity. So we have to take a middle path, and this was propagated 2,000 years back by Lord Buddha, who said the middle path is the golden one. I would like to thank you very much now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think we can now open the floor for questions. So I will start picking up a few questions uh, that are already there on the panel. And if there are more, please do type it in and I'll try to accommodate them. Uh, so uh, you ended with uh, ambiguity. And I think uh, that question has piqued everybody since you quite focused on it during your talk. So a couple of uh, questions on that uh, regarding whether there is ambiguity in scientific text, uh, in scientific papers, etc. And <clears throat> as languages are evolving, uh, are they evolving to a situation where there is less and less ambiguity in languages? Or what is the situation there? Less and less ambiguity, I not agree. Okay. We depart more and more from gra from grammar. One of the uh, roles of uh, grammar syntax is to constrain us, to keep us moving in the right direction on a narrow straight path. That is the role of grammar. So I'll give an example. Uh, agreement in grammar, for example. Uh, um, he laughs is all right, but he laugh is not all right. So, but you do see this kind of um, ungrammatical text in the corpus. This is very common. And uh, when we uh, stray away from grammar, it can introduce uncertainty, noise, and ambiguity in the text. So language is not becoming less and less ambiguous. It is becoming, in fact, more, more and more uncontrolled and more and more noisy. So it is really introducing ambiguity. And the first part of the question was? So this was regarding scientific text, scientific. scientific papers. Scientific text definitely has less ambiguity. In fact, scientific text often uses uh, though the, you, the writer himself or herself is not aware, controlled English. So every scientific domain has its own parlance, own uh, style of writing, and this is very strictly controlled. If you depart from that, then the domain experts raise their eye eyebrows. And the other point is that once the domain is fixed, many of the words have very unique meaning. So again, my favorite example is bank. If the text is from financial domain, I know it is financial bank and not river bank. So scientific text definitely has less ambiguity. OK, thank you, sir. Uh, so another interesting uh, question. So uh, you talked about uh, generation of responses uh, from a chatbot. Uh, and these are finally machine learning uh, systems. So uh, they may go wrong at times. So are there any costs associated with uh, system making uh, such uh, erroneous responses? How can we account for that? Uh, yeah. There have been cases where chatbots have come up with uh, really offensive responses, which have causes, caused bad publicity for companies. Yes, yes. There can be biased responses, gender biased, and so on. Yes. So, uh, yes, so uh, the output is polite, and appropriateness of CARSI has been an important concern for us. The human evaluators especially look at uh, the appropriateness of the response. And, uh, you know, and what if the question is on what is the solution? Yes, we um, really don't know. So the maximum likelihood estimate part of the loss function ensures adequacy, ensures faithfulness information transfer. But the, I would say that the, if the reward function is refined and designed appropriately, maybe we'll have a kind of safety net. Yeah, and maybe care during mining of the data also. If finally yeah. the data turns up, in this case, probably it was manual, manual data, but whenever data is being kind of curated in a semi-automatic fashion, the data mm. itself may contain noise. That's true. So you brief, you, towards the end, you mentioned upon uh, uh, emotional responses being very important for uh, computation for systems going forward. So 
could you just talk about like some concrete applications that you know of are currently in place or you expect to see uh, soon? Yes. So uh, in uh, most of the educational institutes, uh, we have uh, online counseling service. Okay. So I'm not proposing that the counseling service should be done by a chatbot. Okay. There should be an actual psychologist, psychiatrist, a very sympathetic, sympathetic person there. But many times uh, we see because of the volume of the task, some kind of automation may be necessary. Okay. And uh, such, uh, such uh, systems, uh, whenever they need automation, they will have to make use of such techniques. And this is a real scenario where automation assistance is required. And uh, and uh, you know Air India, for example, insurance companies, they have reported. They have reported the SpiceJet, Indigo. They have reported that their business volume increases when the users perceive the chatbot to be more have more empathy. Okay, sure. Uh, maybe I'll end with one final question. Uh, so, uh, and since. Uh, that's a topic I think you work on and are very interested in. Uh, so uh, you talked about a lot of work which deals with uh, emotion analysis, sentiment analysis in English. Now, it's a difficult problem compared to a lot of formal texts. Uh, when you're dealing with emotion, it already becomes very difficult to process it. Now, if you also have to do cross-lingual applications of the kind that you mentioned towards the end, then what do you think uh, is the future in terms of doing cross-lingual learning for these kind of sentiment, emotion kind of problems? Yeah, I'll first uh, talk about the obstacle. So the obstacle is that um, my favorite example, again, maybe as a student, you have heard it many times, that uh, uh, the uh, East Asian countries have a very uh, interesting culture. They, are not, they do not use strong adjectives. Even if the emotion is intense, the adjectives used are very moderate, very controlled adjectives. Whereas uh, as you proceed towards the West, the intensity of the adjective increases. And in fact, in regions like California, it is customary to use very strong adjectives. Amazing performance, for example. It's quite intense, quite strong. So, so uh, emotion and sentiment analysis is very culture and language specific. And cross-lingual sentiment analysis, emotion analysis, where the data is from one language and the application is in another language that has this challenge to negotiate. But that said, uh, machine translation along with uh, sentiment analysis technique available for one language can really facilitate sentiment analysis in another language. And also, uh, we would think that uh, you, know, you have been working on zero-shot learning, one-shot learning, and so on. Deep learning systems which are trained on, trained for sentiment analysis in one language, after training, the weight parameters can serve as initialization for sentiment analysis of another system. So this would be some kind of transfer learning, I would say. So this assistance is available from machine learning literature. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, we are running out of time. We have had a lot of questions. There are many more, but I think for now, we'll close the session. So I'll hand it back over to Sushila. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Clearly, this uh, session has been a very interesting one. You took us right from the fundamentals through to what is happening and uh, on to look at what is, uh, you know, what things are going to be happening in the future. And uh, very, it was lovely to hear about what's happening right here in India and, uh, you know, the kind of exciting things that are happening here. It's re really nice to hear about all of that. I'm sure any youngster who's looking at uh, his or her areas of research would certainly find this uh, very uh, interesting and, and something that they would look forward to. Um, I, I think you also highlighted the fact that some of these courses of study and work 
are going to require not just computation, but also some of the social sciences also yeah. have a bearing on uh, what is required to make something like this actually happen, to realize uh, the potential of something like this. And um, uh, the, the one, one other thing that you did mention was there are things that a machine can do and there are things that a machine can't do and where you still need human experts. And it's, it's important to kind of understand where those lines need to be drawn. So thank you very much. Uh, this, this obviously a topic like this needs much more than uh, a one and a half hour webinar. And someday we hope we can run a workshop with you on, on this uh, topic. Uh, so uh, thank you Anup uh, very much for having taken this on uh, you know, uh, so readily and for uh, running the questions through and the discussion through uh, in such a nice way. Uh, thank you to all of our audiences for being part of our webinars and for uh, being here today. Uh, you, you can look for all of these recordings on our YouTube channel. And with this, once again, thank you and namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste.